uh, the different local decision making capabilities and assurances for the evaluation methodologies. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about the funding opportunities that um, come along with these early literacy targeted interventions. Um, we're going to get a little more clarity on the home based program. Um, we do have a little bit of um, information to share about that. Um, and then we would like to have you guys share with us some maybe questions from the field so that we can continuously get answers to the questions that are needed. Um, and then um, we're going to talk a little bit about data. Okay, so everyone should have um, the agenda for today's meeting. It was sent um, along with the invite. Um, so I think the first thing that we were going to go ahead and do is someone taking attendance. Jackie or Marie? Yep, we can get it. Okay. I'm in attendance and we have these announcements also before we start on the objectives. So go but go ahead. Right. Um so we just wanted to kind of I don't know if you want to lead this part, Jackie, talking a little bit about screening, um, some of the letter templates that we have and the tools and some of the the different dates. Yes. I'll turn my video on. Sorry, we're in a snowstorm here and it's causing some issue. So um, we have determined the dates. This is not new information, April, May, or June. Um, the screening tools, the evaluation methodology, the approved tools, um, those are out there, schools have them, they're making decisions. Um, we have developed a, a letter template for eligibility. eligibility. And you'll yeah. see that in the agenda. Am I breaking up? No, you sound great now. Okay. Um, so the, the there is an example on the agenda, but that has also been put on the web page for you. Also, let's see the screening, the tools, the dates. Um, yeah, I think just we that... have had some school. We have had some schools say they are going to use something else, and there, um, there will be some assurances involved with their reporting for that. Um. I don't know if Christy wanted to add anything to that that we haven't been able to visit, um, but. Sure, hi. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, good to see you all. Um, yes, when, uh, when, when schools are entering in the information for the enrollment into these, uh, these intervention programs, um, they, if they, they, have the so there will be a drop down where they can select the screening tool they use and if they use other there will be a blank for them to fill in and then assurances will pop up that they meet those four requirements for the board of public education <laughs> I'm not repeating something that you all have just said but we we do want to build those assurances in because that's part of the rules that the board of public education has outlined for us to follow and um this is the way that we felt like we could really just make that as as easy as possible for schools, but yet also to have that very specific assurance that they're that if they choose another screener, it meets those four qualifications from the Board of Public Education that it's evidence based, um, that type of thing. So, um, so those are built do, into. Do you have to prove that, or you just trust it if we say yes? Well, it's, I mean that that I mean why wouldn't someone just say yes if I took. I mean, I'm going to use an approved screener, so I'm not worried about it. But for my <laughs> colleagues who are asking, if all they have to do is yes, what is, I mean, you can use whatever screener you want then. Yeah. And, you know, Lori, I think that I really think back to um, something that you said and that you just sort of said, and 
that you've said in other meetings that I've been with you on, it, you're just so oh, spot on. Like, why would you use a different one, especially when these, you know, these are available and approved, and you know they already do it. And um, and I think that's exactly right. And I think that what ha they they'll have to list what it is, so we'll know what the what it is called. Um, and then those those assurances then are sort of the that just the reminder, like you have to make sure it does these things. But it's still just a yes, no. So there's no real proving it. It's a yes, it's a yes, no. We don't have a way for them to upload the evidence of that, but we do have a way to understand which screener it is for there to be that. So when I um, I have talked uh, to uh, the Board of Public Education, McCall, about this, and then we'll be able to give them that report that says, oh, these schools use this other screener, they then, um, have that option, you know, to kind of look at that and we would have that data to move forward with um, in some way. And so um, in my conversations with McCall, that has has um, seemed good to them, just especially because we are going to get the information on what that screener is. So that's sort of where we're we, I mean, we've looked at some that we know don't fit. If somebody okay. uses it, they're going to say yes, because they think it does. What's the consequence? Good question, Lori. I mean, if there's I no consequence, I'm just going to use whatever screener I want to. <laughs> yeah. So. And there isn't a consequence built into the law, but it would be interesting to see what, you know, for the reporting then a year later, how are you doing? How did that screener do what do for you? How did that go? And so that it starts to become accountable in a perfect world in that longer term vision, I think, too. So we're hoping that that's kind of where that comes through. In general, though, Lori, I hope that you're exactly right that that um, that most districts and schools will will use the approved ones, um, so that we're getting that that we know that they're doing, you know, that they're getting that that evidence based screener that's doing exactly what we need it to do in April, May, and June prior to these, you know, grade levels or preschool levels. So, um. So that's really it on screening updates. What's the uh, letter template? So we have two letter templates that we've developed. One of them is um, a consent letter template, parent consent. Um, and then the other one is an eligibility. And uh, where are those? So they're linked on the agenda today, but okay. they are also um, linked on our website under um, reading and early literacy. Sorry. They sh they should be in a uh, Word document so you can. Yeah, alter I just those. found them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Committed to keeping common resources linked in that uh, collaborative agenda um, for you guys. Sometimes they're, but often. How are our colleagues that aren't on this collaborative supposed to be getting those? Getting those letters and templates, how would they know those exist? So they're on website. And so when a couple of different ways that the school was, we give them all of the information that we have links. And then if a school fills out the survey, we also have, re today was the first day I reached out to every single person that has filled out the survey with a uh, specific Link Can center. we not though, and, and I, I hear that, I'm just thinking about people who are in the field drowning right now. They don't have time to go check the website for something that might be there. They don't even know that this is there. Can oh. do we do all have a list serve for every superintendent in Montana where you can just send these? Yeah. Or instead of people having to come find them? I'll be in the compass as well. And so we're we the compass the monthly communication. So that will be in the they'll be in the compass is what oh. she's She's that trying to say. <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna just link them and send them to my people. Can I do that? Because absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And Lori, I think you bring up a good point too about um, for the collaborative. Anyone here on the collaborative? Any of these that you? If you have a network of uh, educators, superintendents, you know, uh, principals, people who would maybe need this information, absolutely share those links with them so they can have that information. That's that's um, uh, very helpful for. Um, uh, for part of this, uh, the people on this collaborative, any, you know, way to share out this information is absolutely helpful. So thank you for doing that. Oh, and I, and I'm, I'm going to do that because I'm on this call, but if there's a region not represented who doesn't do that, it shouldn't be up to a school to have to go find this stuff. I don't understand why we can't just send these to superintendents. 
I, I'm so frustrated by the lack of, I mean, there's so many good things here, right? This, these are incredible yes. letters that can be super helpful. And you're going to have people thinking y'all didn't do anything and that you didn't give them to them because they're not, it doesn't matter if you make them, if they're not communicated out. And I, I'm just frustrated for my colleagues who are under so much pressure right now. The idea that they have to know to go look for this is really frustrating. And I'm looking at it while I'm fussing. Sorry. Am I seeing, they look like the exact same letter. What? I don't understand. They look like the same letter. I put it in the chat um, that for some reason it linked, the links are the exact same yeah. letter. Okay. The, the eligibility, eligibility letter is there, but the consent to uh, test is not there. Right. Yep. It's Cause just I just tried to download thing. them both. Okay. Kimberly, so, or Jackie is that, that gets updated. Is that on the website or was that coming from the agenda, Lori? So I'm on the agenda, agenda. that I shared today and it's the same okay. document for both. And then I just okay. put the link that Marie put in, in the chat and nothing is coming up for me at all. It's just blank. On okay. the OPI link? Yeah, the OPI link that Marie just put in, 3.41 p.m. When I click it, I just get a blank screen. I get nothing. Okay, well, we'll make sure that we get those um, to you. Okay. So is the, okay, now I've refreshed and I finally got something. So which one is the, where's the consent one? The, the consent letter is. That one's right on the OPI website. I was just able to pull that up. Okay, I got it. Thank you. You want to search for you? Okay, I'll go. So that we can walk through all the resources on the right hand side. Let me. I'm going to have to get into a different, um, let me, let me get those up. <laughs> Bear with me for a second. Well, we're going to talk about communication. We did finally fix that error that we talked about at this meeting a while ago. So without you pointing it out and saying, I'm not getting those, we wouldn't have been able to go back to our communications director and say, they're not getting these. What do we need to do? So right. please, like I said, keep telling us. We want to fix and those. We thank you. And I, I do appreciate that because now I get them. This would be an excellent thing for the communications director to send out to everybody. Hey, did you know OPI has been working on these documents that could help you? Yeah. And so did you get the, we need the follow up. Absolutely. Did you get the press release that went out on February 6th with the survey and things like that? I'm just with trying survey, to. Yes, but I don't want to do the survey. Why not? I'm just curious. Because we already have a needs assessment for our district and I don't yeah. want to do. No, this is the one that came out specifically about what you want to enroll your school in, in terms of early literacy targeted. Hang on. I'm looking. Tell me the date again. February 6th. Hang on. And who would be the sender if I'm searching by that? Be in the lister for the press release. Mm. I don't know we, what that's called. Does anybody know well, what that's called? And we do try to use the compass for our main everything. I know. And, and that main everything, asking somebody to read through that compass and run a school. Is yeah. Kind of not I, yeah. I understand. I'm looking for February 6th. So I'm looking for a press release from February 6th, right? Okay, hang on. All right. Got it. I found it. Okay. <laughs> so that survey is just to indicate whether or not your district is planning, anticipating to do it so that we can help provide resources. And we're contacting all of them directly and anyone else saying, hey, by the way, please yeah. check our website, please come to our office hours, all those pieces so that we can communicate to the people who need it the most. Okay, so can you guys all see my screen for the letter? Everyone can see it. Yep, and I've got both letters now, so they're both. I got okay. them on the website. Okay. Um. So this this particular letter is um the parental consent letter that we drafted up. Um, that you can feel free to share and and use. Um. And then the other one is the eligibility letter. I do want to know that it's consent slash request because as it's written in the bill, it does say request. But of course, if they don't know it's an opportunity, how can they request for it? So 
we wanted to make right. sure that they, that language was in alignment with the bill, but also gave you what you needed for your documentation purposes. And then um, this is the eligibility letter that I'm sharing right now. Um, and then you can fill in the, the specifics in terms of um, what programs your specific site is offering. Any questions on the letters? Um, we'll get back to And of that. course, schools do not have to use those, but some no. schools, it's hard to even just think about what to come up with. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that was, those, those were the announcements. As we go through this, if you have brought questions from the field, please put them in the chat as we're going. Okay so that we might be able to hopefully get to a point at the end of these where we could have answers for you to leave with today because we it's April 1st before we come back again. Right. Okay, so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about funding, right, Jackie? Yeah. Um, so we just really wanted to highlight, um, just kind of do a review um, on what funding is available um, per each um, program within these um, early literacy targeted intervention programs. So the sum summer jump start, they can receive the um, additional quarter A and B for each eligible student served in a jump start program. Um, we did have clarification um, today that we do need to make sure that um, that program the hours start accumulating on or after July 1st. Um, and that's 120 hours of instruction and a minimum of four weeks. Um, the curriculum that they're using should be aligning with the Montana Early Learning Standards um, and the Montana Content Standards for ELA and Literacy. Um, the classroom-based is basically just the four-year four-year-old program. Um, the district receive will receive full or half-time A and B for each eligible student served in this early literacy intervention classroom. So half-time would be 360 instructional hours and full-time would be 720 instructional hours. Um, and again, the instruction has to align to the Montana Early Learning Standards. Um, and then the home-based program, um, there's $1.5 million set aside for that program to be funded. Um, and each student that participates in that, we can have up to $1,000 um, per student. So it would be a maximum of 1,500 students. Um, so just kind of an update on that, we do have the RFP posted now. So we are looking for um, vendors that that could possibly accommodate this need. Um, so we're kind of, we've started that, that um, process. Any questions or comments on funding? Oh, well, you know, I got one, right? Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> It's, it's a comment <laughs> and maybe not a necessary one, but I can't let it go considering it's the number one comment in the field that I'm hearing right now. The, the grave disappointment in OPI's interpretation of the July 1 start when the legislature clearly told them and clarified yesterday that the intent was we could start after school was out. I know there's nothing anyone on this call can do about it. I know it was clarified today. But you ask if there were comments, and I want to let you know what a disappointment that is to serving students at the full capacity for early learning, early literacy interventions, and how that's preventing us from doing that to full capacity this summer. So just really disappointed in FPI's interpretation of that and wanted to share that. Thanks, Lori, for sharing that. Um, and uh, we have heard that, yes. Okay, are there any other questions or comments about around funding? 
see. Is there an end date for when those need to be submitted or when that decision um, would potentially be made? We just want to make sure for our community and surrounding communities that we're like on it. <laughs> right. Yeah, this is the decision. So I for now, this is the way the decision is. It, it is not going to change. It really, you know, it really comes down to yeah. the words that are in the bill that of the effective date. And we you know, we understand you hear the legislator going back, like that, but, um, but yeah, this is the way it's going to be July 1st this year. And it's not that you can't start right in June. It's just the hours have to accrue after July. Um, and we hear everything we understand completely, but it really is just the effective date of this bill um, in those uh, sections. So so thanks, Caitlin, for your question. Sorry, you. My question was about um, the RFP for the the um, oh, home sorry, base program. The no, home that's base. Okay. Oh, I thought um, you broke no, up. So I, that's a big issue. You're talking about the other one. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. Um, I was just wondering. Um, we just want to make sure um, for our district that um, you know we're kind of on top of that for um, students in our communities because uh, I know that that's probably going to get pretty competitive, and I'm just wondering if we have an, a date that that um, all of those need to be in or how that will work. Jack, or Camille, do you want me to answer that one? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, we, so we plan, we hope, you know, it is at the State Procurement Bureau now, and we have got a combined um, committee with uh, Board of Public Education and the OPI to review those RFPs when they come in. By the May um, but public Board of Public Ed meeting, uh, which is in early to mid-May, that's when we hope to have the decision made on who the, the you know, the winner of the RFP process is, um, and we'll take that to them. So we hope by um, mid-May to have that. Um, and then can you look at the information on the person of first serve, how do you make sure that that by the end of June, everyone should have and I think I know Marie, you are breaking up just a little bit, but I think that it was um, she is just pointing out that we'll be coming out with the first come first served basis as required in the bill and really trying to make sure that that is an equitable distribution across the, the various district sizes in the state so that there is, it will be competitive, but also we wanna make sure that those, you know, the various uh, schools all have a, an equally competitive um, uh, process to, to requesting um, some of those spots. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Thanks, Caitlin. I answered Lori's question times two, I guess. <laughs> uh, thank you, and I appreciate, Krista, your kindness and professionalism. And uh, I just, um, you know, the legislators clearly said that's not the interpretation. So to say it's just the date feels like not really, whatever, I need to just move yeah. on. It is what it is. And we're not going to be able to start until July 1 due to OPI interpretation. Yeah. And um, and really, I think, too, we try to just, we've been really also kind of trying to focus on just really the great part of this bill is actually that it's here and we're getting to start to do it, you know, and so. Uh, we'll keep the um, positivity there as well. So, but thanks, Lori. We hear you. Are there any other questions before we move on? I don't hear any. Okay. Um, so I think we kind of addressed a lot of this just now talking a little bit about the home-based learning. So, um, uh, so I don't know that we need to go over that again. It. Right. I think a little bit about what we put on the RFP for your guys' knowledge. Um, part of what we were asking vendors is to ensure that a lot of the tech, like the technical pieces, that that goes back and forth as much as possible between the parents so that the districts do not have to be the mediator between parents and the vendors. So you're like, oh, my charging cord's broken. Oh, hold on, let me go call the vendor. So one of the things we built into there is to make sure that they have that access and that responsibility to supporting parents with those pieces, as well as parental reporting, school-based reporting, and then the level of reporting we get at the state so that we have that comprehensive set of 
who gets what, everyone has access. There's not another report the district has to print out and send to schools. Because uh, I, I printed many, 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 many reports out and sent as parents. So it's just one more thing off of the district's plate that we try to build that into the RFP. So hopefully it's as seamless as possible when it comes to the district side of that implementation for that program. Any questions about the RFP or things we built into there for districts to kind of understand and navigate that better? Okay. I do, I do have a question on the first come first serve. What it, is that like, I mean, timestamp, like parent first come first serve, like when they hit the button on a keyboard, how do they? So that will be based, it will be timestamped and that will be based, but when we put this out, we'll have to have the eligibility for every district. You'll already have that by the time this comes out. Okay. So then we'll have to do first base, first come first serve. Now, we're hoping we've also built in like bonus points in the RFP. If you can come under that thousand dollars so we can get more than mm. 1,500 students and pieces like that, because that's a big deal. Also so, putting in providing devices instead of the district having to provide devices. That was something we also put in there is what we would like to see coming out of this program. So two questions on that, Marie. Mm -hmm. um, are you going to give us whatever it is that we send out to our list of eligible students ahead of time that explains this is the day you open, it's first come, first serve. You have to, is that going to be some common language that every district gets for us to share with parents so they know when it's opening, when the first come, first serve happens, is my first question. And then secondly, are you going to look at any regional or school or demographic representation? For example, if Evergreen's parents were really on it and they took up the first 200 slots, are you going to let that happen? Or are you going to, you know, if you have a big school district, one of our big double A's and they get on there first and they take all the spots, are we going to try and have representation from A, double A, C, B, rural, you know, or tribal schools? Uh, you know, I'm just wondering, two part, are you giving us the information so we let parents know how to do it? And then are we considering any kind of representation? So, First, I think that's a great question to bring up. Should it be the districts that are enrolling because they have the eligibility to reserve slots or do the parents directly do it? Because then we have to verify that this child's eligible anyway. So logistically, what makes more sense to you from the school side? And then also having Christy and our team in the room because parents might try to sign up and their kid's actually not eligible or whatever that might be. Well, and parents may try to sign up and have very poor internet and lack of access to a device. I mean, that's an equity issue if we're saying first come, first serve based on parents understanding how to operate the technology and having access. I'm just really concerned about that. So that's my perspective is that we were going to have the districts based on the number of students they had qualifying based on their eligibility determination. And also in the RFP, not only did we mention device, providing device, but providing access, whether it be a hotspot or whatever that means, so that we do have that equity component built in. So we're not having those barriers for those deep rural people in those places. So that's a great thing to bring up. Thank you, Lori. Oh, you're muted. Hold on. And if the district is doing it, right? And so let's just say, I'm thinking in our area, Kalispell Public Schools is going to do it. And it's by district. If Kalispell enters first, their list of 600 kids, they take 600 of the 1,500 spots immediately if you do it that way. I mean, it seems like there's got to be some kind of way to, um, you know, guarantee regional representation and that one large district, if the district is doing it, doesn't take up mm -hmm. half the spots for the whole state. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's got to be. I think that's exactly part of why we sort of we want to do it uh, by the district sort of level, first come, first serve, because then we can, um, it'll be um, easier for, to sort of ensure an equitable distribution across various district sizes, right? And so um, rather than parents, like if parents are participating in the first come, first serve, we then have to have the, the level of knowing what districts they're at, right? Whereas if it's the districts, there's a double A, first come, first served, an A, B, oh, C, cool. first come, first served sort of windows that are kind of concurrent. And so you wouldn't be necessarily competing against the, you know, the district next to you that might be smaller or larger. You're competing against other districts of the same size. 
in order to try to equitably distribute that a little bit better. That's kind of our idea right now. That's sort of where we're leaning towards it, that there would be a district person who would enter in, hey, we would like to have, you know, 25 spots for our 25 eligible kiddos. Um, Marie and Kimberly and Jackie, I hope I'm representing that as well. But, from the but if a larger district entered in, we want, I'm making mm -hmm. it up, 500 slots. Mm -hmm. They would automatically get them if they were first to hit the button. Well, and I think it, we have to look at how many slots we're going to have exactly because it, part of this is dependent upon that RFP. And if they come mm -hmm. in less than those 1,500, we might have 2,000 spots. But let's so just say they have 2,000. If a district yeah. takes 500 of them, they get 25% of the right. allotment for the whole state. That is not equitable. There's got no. to be a way to do this that when you get all the ones in, a percentage, whatever percentage that right. is, your each district gets 3% of what they put in or something. Well, something. It can't be that we give 500 slots to the first large district that hits enter. Yeah, so I like your idea of like class size, but what other ideas do we have for that? We haven't determined that yet. This is part of why you guys get to help us and contribute and collaborate with that. So I like the idea of class size. So a double A, A, B, C. What other ideas? And then small schools, because I know that they, they get their own little special when they're those ultra, ultra rural. But what other ideas do you have about how to make that equitable? Um, so that Bozeman doesn't get all of them and the rest of us get nothing. Um, got, I, I like the idea of class. What other ideas do you have? Regional? So everybody gets put in first and you take away, because the way it's written here, it made it like that was already the decision. It says that's it straight first come first serve. And so I thought that was already a decision, not for discussion. So if you took away first come first serve, every district must enter them by this time on this morning. And then we will equally distribute them across the state and I, not first come I, first serve. Lori, I think the challenge is that the bill actually says first come, first serve. If the, we go over the allotted amount, mm -hmm. that's what it says. So if we are over that 1500, it says first come, first serve. I, I think you got to come up with something. I don't think you can do, uh, you know, Great Falls hits enter and take 600 of the spots. I, I just... I, I don't see how that's reasonable. reasonable. Well, and I feel like, Lori, I think in my mind, in thinking of it from that perspective, um, I'm and I'm I'm just brainstorming here. Um, you know, I'm wondering if there's, you know, percentages of students in each of these categories, right? And so like 60% of students are in double A schools, for example. So that 60% of the slots are first come, first serve for those schools. Then yeah. You know, C schools are 30% of students and then they get 30% of the spots, depending how many slots we have. So I, in my mind, I was sort of thinking there would be these sort of different categories of there would be different slots allotted as a first come first serve so that the com competition is for those kind of that same percentage number of spots for wherever you are, if that makes sense. Sense. Yeah, no, that makes much more sense. That's not just a direct first come first serve. Correct. It was. Right? It, it still honors the first come first serve, and and we all know everyone has different interpretations of the law, <laughs> and we use the pieces we like when it works to so <laughs> our advantage. So, <laughs> yeah, there's got to be a way to honor the law of first come first serve and not be inequitable across the state. No, I like that. Thank yeah, you. and that's that's sort of I think what what I had been envisioning is you know, percentage equitable first come first serve um, on that. Yeah. I had, put, I think that I, I won't pull it up, but I'd started sort of a chart, but I need to work with Christy on that. Um, that's basically how I envision it too. But we, we, who knows? We, we haven't had a really very many, any big schools that all say that they were interested in the home-based but but I would I would say be careful with that because I just completed your survey just now. Yeah. Just because I didn't say I was interested doesn't mean I can't do it. I mean no, that's true. That's so true. I don't I don't know how much you can use that survey is what I'm. I just did it because yeah. you told me it was there and I wanted to. It didn't stand out to me as something I really needed to complete when I read it the first time. It's just buried at the bottom of the email. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not and maybe they're not doing it right. But I think too that's just that's an intent. Just we could change our minds once you get the actual RFP solid and we know what it is. People may then decide, oh my gosh, this is really good. I want to do it. So I'm not sure that that survey can be useful to say who's going to do what. Yeah. yeah. And Lori, I think, and, and, and I think that's true to your point. And it's, and this is one of those moments where it's, 
we think there's going to be at least 1500 spots, but we're hopeful that a vendor might come through with a bunch more. And so, but yeah. we still need to have, you know, even if that happens and we're able to actually have more spots, you know, have what that looks like, you know, 60% reserved for double A's, the right. next percent and next percent, and that that's the process that goes through um, for that. To me, that seems to make the most sense because we're, it's the most equitable first come first served. Um, right. Basis. And it still honors first come first serve. I think, you know, making sure you keep in mind, there's a category for K-8, A, double A, B, C, and should there be a separate category for tribal schools? You know, I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying we need to keep those things in consideration if you're going to disperse them across percentages of different classifications. Yeah. And Lori, I think that's an excellent point. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Yeah. Uh, okay. There was a question of what is the name of the RFP? Uh, put it in the chat from the um, RFP I, website. And it's yep. still in draft mode, but it does, that's what it will be called in the event number. And I just followed up with our contract manager to, to remind them to please get this moving along. It's been sitting there for a little bit. So I did just send over another reminder where <laughs> please open this RFP. It's been approved. It's been waiting there. So we're um, we're working on that. But with, with the State Procurement Bureau, it, it, we are at their um, leisure of time to get yes. that open. Put it in drive. <laughs> okay. Early objective four, I think. Right. So um, the next objective is just talking a little bit about data collection. So um, the initial data that we're going to be collecting will be housed in Infinite Campus. Um, and so um, information such as student eligibility and the literacy skills that were not passed and the screener that was being used to qualify the student. Um, and then we will be collecting additional data, but that will be coming in a different format, a different survey um, that we are currently working on building right now, but we definitely want to get that information out to schools, to districts as soon as possible so that they can um, be aware of what types of data we are going to be looking at collecting from them. And that's specifically just to clarify for the annual report that will be due in a year. Um, there are reporting requirements and this second data collection is very specific to that annual report. Right. I'm trying to find, I'm looking on the agenda for today. Where can I click on what that data is? So we're still in development of the actual tool. And it's that survey, but that's just really how we're collecting the data. And we are developing that component. When you look at the bill itself, that's where we've had several meetings digesting what the bill is actually asking us. So I'm going to copy and paste into the chat what it has within the bill. Um, I'm going to go through. So I Sorry, it's all... really hard to understand you. I'm sorry. I have my camera. Okay. If you, I'm going to put the bill in here. Yep, got it. Page four. Page four. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we will bridge this barrier. So when we, can you hear me now? I feel like the over is in partials every time I say that. Darn it. We can hear you, Marie. It's a slightly breaking up, but um, we can hear you. And we can okay. see your screen too, or the screen that's sharing the. Okay, perfect. I, just, so, I put the bill up for you, Marie. So if you want to talk through it. Perfect. So when we are looking at that section four, uh, we are asking trustees offering an early literacy targeted intervention stop, shall closely monitor the program and report annually to the superintendent of public instruction on the efficacy of the program. And that's really the part that is important to us. Like we do not need student level data, like their exact 
what they scored on oral reading fluency in second grade from fall, every progress monitoring, winter benchmark, every progress monitoring. So what we will need is their initial eligibility. And we so some parts that we're debating, including that would be helpful for legislation is how each district determines that eligibility. Because you could use the Pelly and Caitlin School could use the Pelly, but you might have very different cut scores and eligibility determination. So that's something we're pondering. Like, is that useful for us as we're reporting to legislation? Because they could say, like, why does Bozeman have 200 students that are that age qualifying, but Belgrade only has 18 or whatever it might be. That could be the wrong number. And then we could understand better. They're using complete, like they get to determine their eligibility and they're using completely different cut scores, which is completely allowable for them to target their most at risk of not of reaching reading proficiency. Um, so then we are asking, based on this classroom-based intervention, did you see growth is one, but also did, will they continue to be eligible based on the following screens, April, May, June, eligibility screeners? And also asking like through your formative assessments, how many students demonstrated growth? This all has to be, they put anonymized. I've never used that word before, <laughs> but we're gonna take it. Um, so we're trying to, put the questions in a way that make the most sense for reporting. And I, I reported so much data that also that makes it not extremely cumbersome, but still captures everything we need to do on our end um, to put that forward. So yes, Jesse, there, so we will in Infinite Campus, you will mark their enrollment, you will mark what programs they are in and the methodology tool used. We're also looking at attendance components, adding the calendar within Infinite Campus, so that you can track that as well, just for the fidelity purposes of the inter intervention. And then also when it comes to A and B, that 360, the part-time enrollment versus the full-time enrollments for classroom days. But then we are building a survey that's gonna have logic built into it. Right now we're using Qualtrics, which is also what we used for um, the CNA, if you use a state level CNA, but building the logic into it. So it's specific to four-year-old classroom, and the interventions that you did. So if you just did classroom based, building it in so the questions are aligned to just classroom based. If you just did jumpstart, if you just did home, which home based we're considering, we'll get a lot of that reporting. So what do we need to know? Um, what other questions do you have about these components that would be helpful for us to consider from, from the district side? At first they wanted everything in infinite campus and I'm like, I'm sorry, no. I have had to enter so many individual reports on Infinite Campus, and it's not super friendly, so we wanted a better way to <laughs> Yeah, I just wonder where it says at the bottom, C, including but not limited to. So some of that, um, you know, like it says, had 75% or more proficient. Well, if you didn't, you had 70%. Where can you account for that? If you were at 30 and you went to 70, that's incredible. Yeah, it says including but not limited to. So it seems like there should also be some indicators of what was your growth. OK, yeah, 75 percent. What was it? And then the next yeah. one, that D2 improved percentage of 10 percent or more. OK, if it wasn't 10, what was it? Right. So it's yeah. not just a even though we know we have to report on those. It says it's not yeah. limited to that. So any way we can show growth, if a kid has a nine percent growth and we can't share that with someone, that would be discouraging. That's exactly what we discussed this morning. Like, we don't want them to say it's not working because they didn't exit. What if they just took an extra year to exit? They did classroom based as a four year old. They did, did one year of um, home base and then they exited. What if they never exit? What if they do every yeah. year, but at the end, they're, they're one percentage away from proficiency? When they started, they were 40% away. Yes. You yes. know, so I think we've got to add some more things in there where if you don't hit those last two, D1 and D2, that what was it so you can still show and and if you're not able to show stuff okay <laughs> but you know yep. if you can show it I think that that would be important yes thank you yep I don't want them to just eligible or not eligible we need a little bit more but also not going down to each individual student's progress monitoring reports and submitting those pieces we want to know did they grow did they are they still eligible how specific do you think is fair to ask schools when turning in this data to help support 
these programs are working, we want to continue them. And here's how we're demonstrating growth. What other kind of questions or things do you think are fair to ask districts to help inform us better? Well, and while we're thinking of that, sorry to take off the, I think it's a great question and I want everyone's input, but I also wanted to point out on this top of this page is A, the evaluation methodology that led to the eligibility for the program. Mm -hmm. And um, that to me, Lori, is a little bit circling back to kind of your point. Like if schools are using tools that aren't, you know, screening tools that maybe don't work as well or didn't capture as well or something, this would be a moment where we would have some evidence of that. Just you know, in the long-term focus, just, I know it's not perfect, but um, this is kind of the line that I was thinking of a little bit, you know, in going forward for that. Um, Does it but, say, I'm looking back at the start of four and it just says trustees closely monitor report annually. So when, it, when is that annual? Is it, I mean, when are you going to do that? By July 15th. So next. So we don't this report week, this year. No, not oh, this okay. week, July, but we want to get the questions out, Lori, just so that schools are aware of what data they need to collect to make the report, if that makes yeah, sense. And on that note, I think it would be fantastic if whatever we come up with for the home based as we get closer to what that looks like and whatever this document is going to look like, because I love what who Jesse asked, you know, another school level entry is, I mean, it's just a lot. Can this team, can this collaborative see it first and yep. we work through each question instead of the first time it goes live, only OPI has seen it? Great question, Lori. And I think we could probably manage that. Are you asking about the infinite campus one? I'm or... asking about anything you're going to ask from us, whatever gotcha. it is, right? Yeah. Can we, can, can the users that are going to be doing this, that are part of this collaborative, see it first as a draft, not to be actually entered, and let us go through and complete it for our school and say, that question is not reasonable. Oh, I wanted to tell you this and it's not on there. Yeah. And then we finalize the tool for collecting data instead of just yeah. take input and make the tool. Let's put that on our April 1st agenda. Yeah. Is that the good next meeting? Yep. And I mean, then we'll I have... think, when I think yep. about the things that are coming down from OPI, like I think if had we done that with accreditation, right, let a few schools see the portal and do it, we could have found some of the mismatches and things that aren't lined up with accreditation. Yeah. You know? So if we can find that as the collaborative and then help our colleagues where we know everything matches and it's ready instead of the first time it's out there to the public, it's already final. I think that could be a real service to the schools. Yeah. I think you're I think you're exactly right. And that's exactly what this collaborative is for, for that exact feedback to provide us that information and for you all to get that, um, it, give us insights from your user perspective and then to be able to share out, um, again, share out with your neighboring school district and, and that kind of thing. So it, it's exactly um, the purpose of this collaborative too. So let's put that on our April 1st agenda. We'll have a really solid draft ready for you. And then we'll also have the logic. So like if you click on classroom base, you're not going to get all the questions about jumpstarting home base. So we're still building in the logic pieces, but we have a draft of the questions ready for your review. So. Okay. Again, pointing out the key word in there is that efficacy piece, because we are trying to prove to legislation that this is a valid, reliable set of interventions or preventions, however you want to look at it, programming that will help our lead learners become reading proficient by fourth grade. Whether or not they exit, whatever, but are they growing and are they getting closer to that trajectory is what we're really wanting to make sure that we can advocate for our districts. Hey, Marie, on that note, I'm just thinking yeah. if you have a district doing more than one intervention, right? Yeah. There's got to be something where you don't have to answer the methodology three times. Yes. Right? Whatever data collection it is, there should be some that apply to all of them, right? Mm -hmm. right? We, we, you don't want to have to answer everything if you did the summer jumpstart. Then go answer it again if you did the classroom base. Then go answer it again if you did the home. Right, well, it has to be one it. thing, and you mark which one yeah. because it, the law says right here by intervention or not, right? So you got to be able to because it says the report must contain a comparison analysis by intervention type, including no intervention. So you have four types, none, and then the three that we're offering. But if yeah. we have to fill this out three times, that's going to be crazy. 
Yeah, which is part of what we're going to build into the logic. There might be some key ones on home-based and Jumpstart and Classroom that are a little bit different, but overall eligibility and growth, we're going to try to keep that in the same area. But again, that's what your feedback as you're going through it. And you reading that legislation and going back with us, like, is this capturing enough for us to prove the point that this is uh, legislation is supporting student learning is exactly what we're going to do. So thank you. Anything else on this current or just thoughts about current data collection and ideas that you have? We, I am not exaggerating where we have talked and gone through this several times, trying to make this easily accessible for districts. Not a huge, huge, huge task. We learned from literacy grant schools and how they reported following the letter of the law, but also like maximizing your voice so that we can capture it and advocate for it. We uh, uh, we started a conversation that we had to put on hold be because we had this meeting, but we also want to make sure that we can collect information that gives a parent voice um, to this, and so that 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 will be interesting to craft the right questions uh, from the parent perspective, because you don't want it to be just a yes or no. So uh, yeah, we, we may ask for feedback for that in the coming weeks. I had a question kind of regarding that, you know, um, fourth grade statewide reading assessment that that's going to be used to show the, you know, whether a student's proficient and that whether or not these interventions worked. Does that mean that even though, you know, next year will kind of be the first year that we're rolling out MAST statewide, that that's going to be the assessment that we're using to show proficiency, even though we may not have enough data to kind of compare and show, you know, what proficiency is? Well, first, we won't have any kids that have gone through the programming yet, other than home-based and potentially jumpstart. However, by next year, we, and I, Lori, I know we've had lots of conversations in the background with people about those components. Um, so when you're thinking about the earliest groups that will use math to determine proficiency, that would be our current Second graders, does that sound right? I believe so. Yeah, and so that's just one snapshot of what they can have. And we will have proficiency scores next year in the math. What, what, we, we can't use proficiency scores in math next year. Next year's still a pilot. No, nope. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm, Y'all are gonna quit inviting me to these meetings, aren't you? Jackie's gonna coincidentally oh, leave no, me no, off. No, 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 yes. Next year, we will have proficiency scores. We're doing. We are going to use a pilot test in its third year when the vendor says it's still a pilot to judge whether or not we're successful. So next year, we are full smart analysis done. It's not a pilot year. Next year uh, is OPI is saying it's a pilot year. It's a pilot, but it is the state state standardized test next year. And I want to make sure we're really clear on those pieces. Like we will have standards. We're not, Marie, we're not clear. When I talked to Julie the other day, I had a 35 minute conversation with her. My understanding was they were going to be reported on the state report card for federal eligibility. That they weren't going to be used anywhere else. So it, it is not clear the communication coming from OPI. So the idea that we would use next year's data yeah. when it's still not even done to judge whether or not early, early literacy is working is it, it's like educational malpractice. I will gain clarity to make sure we have common messaging, but I, we've talked at length about accountability versus statewide assessments and proficiency scores in many realms, but I'll make sure that you all have a clear message, okay? So you're saying MAST next year is going to be used to determine whether or not these interventions we put in place are successful when it's the first well, year we wouldn't have data. It's just fourth grade, so we wouldn't have data yet for the, those fourth graders. Right, but you wouldn't have any pre-data. So how would you use it? If we wouldn't for this purpose. We can't report on that. You're right. Okay, now I'm confused. We would have to wait until the so students small. that are in second grade. Mm -hmm right? Yeah. We would have to wait until they get to fourth grade mm -hmm. to be able to report back on how they performed on the MAST assessment. Which is 26? 
Yep. Yep. So that's in alignment with, with what I was trying to say. If that was unclear, I apologize. But it doesn't say anything about statewide reading assessments administered in third grade. That begins in fourth through sixth, which gives us two years. So this year, second graders, when they get to fourth grade, which let's be honest, we will have that caveat like, hold on, these kids were barely in the beginning of the intervention program. This isn't like, we can't start judging those pieces yet. Okay. I, yep, go ahead, Katie. Sorry, yeah, no, that you, you're you answering my question, but uh, one thing that's making me confused now, based off of what you just said, is if we're not reporting until 2026, however, in the bill it says we'll report no later than September 1st annually, is that? We will have the information from the eligibility after this first year. We won't have summative assessment after this first year because those kiddos wouldn't be in that fourth grade level by then. Did that help with clarity, Katie? But we will have, are they continuing to be eligible? Have they made gross on formative and the screening tools? We will have that information, but we won't have four through six grade. We won't have the post-secondary or eighth grade in high school. We don't have any of that data until the second grade class that gets to be eligible gets to those levels. Hmm. We're hoping that they continue to have everything intervention so that when my three and a half year old is at that post-secondary level we have ex except it won't be like everybody will get the money and all the things right, right. So, yeah so we can't obviously can't report on graduation rates for about 13 years now <laughs> okay so yeah we're you're saying that we kind of have two years to prove that these interventions are successful in order to keep yeah that. well we have a bit of a moment by end yes yeah gotcha. thank yep. you yes yeah Keep asking clarifying questions. I in no way, shape, or form want this to be confusing or when they have this longitudinal data in there that we don't yet have, that's hard. Um, yeah, and one thing we're looking at for future awareness is how to, with our data modernization and making sure that Infinite Campus can capture that for us for one more way when we're checking off, okay, this child in 2026 was eligible for early literacy and, and in 2035, which is insane to even think of, were they on that trajectory of proficient in ELA and literacy? So those are components that we are like, we're thinking 15 years out on this data collection. Right, right. now, we can yeah. only report on the eligibility and the growth reformative or the screening. So question on 4B. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I'm trying to ask, so be patient with me here. So next year when we're not using MAST to see if they were successful, it becomes the baseline for second grade to use two years later, but we're not using it for all students next year to see if they're successful, right? Am I am I saying that correctly? I believe you are saying that correctly. Here's our okay. draft question that we have in there. Right. We're looking at efficacy. So according right. to the progress monitoring and formative assessments, how many students demonstrated growth in reading literacy? So without having to capture student level data on every formative assessment you do, and when they wrote this, you and I know it thumbs up can be formative. You're right. Yeah. That, it, that's what I guess that's what my question is. So next year, let's say a first grader who is going to take, well, they wouldn't take it anyway. You know that. <laughs> yeah. Third grade wouldn't matter. So sec, first, second, these kids aren't taking masks anyway, as we just said, right? Oh. So that they won't have a baseline next year because they're not taking it. Not in terms of right. standard assessment, then, just in terms of the, the screening and the right. form. Right, but is that formative when it says any formative assessments administered? Does is is that's an addition to the screener, right? Like if you gave Ames Web Plus or iReady or Star or Map, is that what that means? Or I mean, you just said it. A thumbs up can be formative. Are you yep. asking districts? Is there going to be some clarification in that drop down when a district is filling that out? What you mean? We, yes, we, and again, legislative intent. I don't think they realize when they put forward an assessment right. that that's five thousand things. So we're going to have some clarification around like, this could be your progress monitoring. If you're using right. Ames Web or if you're using Acadians and you're doing oral reading. What could be your screener that you absolutely. use throughout the year? Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. Monitoring pieces. Right. So we want to be able to capture that because I've had students 
they've grown all year long on their formative, on their progress monitoring, and then it comes to benchmark at the end of the year, and all of a sudden they're not there. And so having that opportunity so that they're showing growth throughout formative assessments, but then the end of year benchmark or the rescreen or whatever we methodology tool 2.0, um, <laughs> then we have other ways to demonstrate growth that is not just screener after screener after screener, they passed or they didn't. But you could theoretically, if you use your screener that one time, April, May, June, and then you continue to use it as a formative assessment tool throughout the year, it could be the same tool. You could. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Especially pulling in the, the different props that they have for all that progress monitoring. Now, I haven't personally done it at the four-year-old level. I've only done that with my students with, that were qualified for an IP and their own progress, but that's a different situation than what I've done for K3 when we pull out the oral reading fluency every other week for those tier two kiddos or whatever it might be. But I love that you're asking these questions from the point of, okay, how much do I have to do that? We're not gonna tell you how often you need to progress monitor. You could do it once in the middle of the year. Mm -hmm. Hey, they grew from the last screen. But if you're following your MTSS structures or whatever that might be, and also home-based learning is a whole other thing where it's going to have built-in formative assessments and the reporting coming out from that. Until we know what those reports and that tool is, it's really hard to determine some of those questions. Right. And yeah. Something else to consider if we yeah. keep on our example of the second grader, right? Yep. Who's first grade right now, start yep. second grade. We start tracking their progress fourth grade there in another district. Mm -hmm. You know, what happens? Who are we responsible for tracking? Just kids that are this, you know, apples to apples, the same. They started with us and they're still with us. And if they're not, we don't have to track at all. You know, we'll need some clarification on that too. Yeah, yeah, that is, that's a tricky one. Um, we could say, because the eligibility resets every time they go to a new district too, right? So if they go from Evergreen and then they go into uh, Russell or whatever it may be. I'm, I'm trying to get my Northwest Montana region. <laughs> um, they will have to go and re-enroll them then, but we aren't collecting student level data. So it's the, uh, if you as the superintendent are reporting on your now first, my daughter's in first grade. So I'm trying to picture her directly in this situation. Um, and she transferred from Conrad to Shelby. That would be new data. So asking and making sure that the students, how, how can we ask if the student has been in concurrent years of intervention. Mm -hmm. That's the question I don't know how to verbalize yet. Maybe and <laughs> I just, I'm a can of worms here. I'm just looking at implementation. If a kid is in another district right now, so he doesn't assess with me April, May, June, he enrolls with me in August. I could not assess him April, May, and June. He wasn't with me. His eligibility resets. Can I assess him right then? Yes, I have that same question. And then do I have to get his old data and show it to you if he's in my new program? Yeah, the kid who moves in between testing and entering one of the interventions. So we've had this, we had this conversation on the advisory council. We've had it with everybody. And it keeps going back to the language of the bill. Of, you may assess in April, May, June. And so that is a question that is Everything I've heard in, in terms of interpretation, and I believe we are in alignment with, we discussed this with McCall also, that it has to be that April, May, June. So if they years. come to me in August, can I use the other districts, April, May, or June, or the kid is just not, can't be eligible? So the kid was eligible in his other district, tested in April, May, June, or the kid didn't test at all. Either way, there's no way to serve him in that year. I mean, really, that only hits that four-year-old classroom program, right? Because summer's already over. The yeah. home spots are going to be taken. Yeah. So it's so really just that four-year-old program that we're talking about. Yep. Yeah. And then we've had, like, the late enrollment questions, too. So we are only asking for the data on eligible enrolled students. If you choose, as a district, to enroll that's the other question we've had a lot about, which I think is fair to bring up, is if they come in later, can we still screen them? My understanding, it has to be the April, May, June eligibility determination during those three months. That's how you set your budgeting. Yep. However, if a school decides to serve students who are not determined eligible, but you just float it how you can as a district to try to get them those services. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, that our, makes sense. But, they, but if they had screening yeah. results, 
What if they had to go from another district? So they were in Kalispell Public Schools. They screened and they were eligible. They move in August. Can I put him in my four-year-old early literacy program? Because he was screened in April, May, June. Yes, I, I love that question. I also want to know this. Yeah, I so I want to ask you this. What if they have completely different eligibility determinations? So what if they don't? A lot of either West. way, does it matter if they were eligible? Like they were already proven to be eligible yeah. for the early literacy program. Right. I'm going back to the bill because this is what I have to do. And I'm rereading it because I know we talked about this today. We've read this 30 times. And every time we read it, we have 10 new questions. Right. And I mean, I can see what you're saying. He didn't screen, can't do it. I don't like it, but I can see reading the bill. But if he screened in the state of Montana using a screening tool that met the methodology and that district determined him to be eligible, why wouldn't he be eligible? I mean, even if it comes down to the school board having to say like, yes, we accept that screening from this other district, like wouldn't then it be down to the board members determining if that eligibility fit within our district rather than OPI at that point? I like that answer. And so we're only talking thinking. about kids in this early, this classroom-based program. Summer will be over. Home spots are going to be taken, yep. right? So you're only talking about one grade level each year that this could hit. Because if it's a second grader, well, he waits and rescreens with you in the spring, right? Yep. So what if you get 10 kids moved in? They, I'm just like, we're totally playing around with different situations. Yep. One comes from Bozeman, one comes from Valier, one comes from Weibo. What if they didn't have a screener? For one thing, is a thought that I just now thought of. And another one is, what if they did, but now you have 10 kids and you don't have the capacity to serve all of them? Yeah. I think this is going to be one that's going to be a local control issue because it's not in the law for OPI to interpret. Yeah. Um, yeah. The April, May, June's in the law very clearly, yeah. right? Yep. But the transfer of a student who did screen in April, May, and June, I think that's going to be, and of course, you're going to have to answer to your people. If you say this kid can go in and this one can't, right? So one thing when you are collecting an IC, what we will need, is, so this will help with that component, is test date and if they were eligible. Right. And that's to make sure we have the April, May, June, and then if they were eligible. Does that kind of help with that prep work? Um, Amanda... So Mandy asked me, I don't know if you mean, meant to do it. So Star Early Lit, um, I believe next Monday, Lori, did that say they removed Star Early Lit from the pre-K four-year-old? That's, you know, that's not how I read it. Let me pull it up real quickly. Um, let's see, McCall, but, I, but I'm not using that one, so I may not have paid as close attention to it as yep. I should, right? So what I've got here is, the more we've looked at the documents, recommendations from the council, inadvertently included star and four-year-old prior to K. What you could do regardless of if it's on the list, if you have the assurances that it's developmentally appropriate, research-based, um, cost-effective, which if that's what you adopted, that's what you adopted, it's cost-effective. And then if possible, align with formative assessments. If you can do that, Oh, I'm so sorry. But, but if, it, if that's going to be a, that goes back to my question we, we just can't answer today. Yeah. Um, that if, that Christy was talking about earlier, if the council has said, for example, star doesn't fit and dial does not fit, we have evaluated them and the answer is no. And a school district uses one of those. Does it automatically say, no, you can't use that? When we judged it and said, no, are we going to accept it from schools if the school's interpretation is it, that it does? I mean, if it's one that, that the council hasn't evaluated, I understand. But if the council's evaluated it and said, no, we're going to let people justify it anyway and accept that? Or We kind of talked about this at the last meeting, too, um, that we would it would be re really good to have a list of all the screeners that have been evaluated, whether or not they mm. were say why they were not approved. That's so that a really good idea, Katie. You yeah. were directed to, that kind of opens up the, well, who does OPI think they are approving or disproving? So that's where why we went to the assurances. You are assuring as a district that you know 
it's research based, cost effective, and the development. But if it's already been proven not to be, OPI is just going to accept it anyway? Because I might change my screener if that's the answer. That is the next answer I don't have. Because then that list of what we have, my understanding from Christy, is that we'll go back to the Board of Public Ed's Advisory Council mm -hmm. on whether or not. So what I'm hearing you say is we need some absolutely no, these will not work. Yeah, if there's some that have already been, uh, what do you call them, evaluated. Yep. Determined, no, these do not meet that. We yep. owe it to our colleagues to tell them that. Yep, and I think that needs to come from Board of Public Ed based on... Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that, Lori? That based on yeah, I, th I think so. I is I don't want it to come from me, right? But, well, and but particularly because, sorry, like our school has a screening set up on April tenth. So if we're planning to choose a screener that is going to get booted on April first, <laughs> yeah, I understand that. <laughs> Why right now we're just doing the check boxes for assurances. Okay. Yeah, right, but I go back to if we're going to make this a, a a process that has fidelity and integrity, we shouldn't say you can just mark yes if you want to. It's an assurance when we know it doesn't fit. I mean, that's it, where I mean, that's a, that local control piece too, yeah. right? Like, for you know, I used dial four for years. I know it would work for this situation. Yeah, but I wanted it to just so you know. I know I did too. I know how many, but it doesn't. And I'm not going to use it. But if you were to tell me no one's going to judge you if you mark yes on the assurance because that's your belief, I might go in and use dial and just mark yes. I mean, you're not going to do anything to me. You're not going to take away my stuff because you've just said you're trusting me that I assured you that that was the thing. It just, I don't know. It just seems like it'd be nice to have a little more. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm asking. You talked to McCall about like, black and white can we also have the advisory council make a list of these ones do not qualify yeah so according to the, uh, the the and it may be that no one's willing to do that and say no but then that means opi can never turn down anyone's screener right if there's no group willing to say this screener is not valid right for this purpose no group is willing to do that opi won't do it advisory council collaborative montana board of public ed no one will produce a no list then opi has got to just it doesn't matter what screener you choose. Every district is going to get to put what they want, their belief, and OPI is going to have to accept it. I don't know how to. How I don't either. I don't, look, this, this just feels like put those worms back in and let's move on. Okay. Uh, Whitney's question. Wait, did I get the other ones above? Whitney's question. So, home based and school based. Um, for an example of a home based, but I don't know if you're. I'm not saying this is the approved one. I just know it's one I have experience with. Waterford, for example, is 15 minutes a day at home. It's not necessarily a full half day program. So it does that help a little bit with your question around that? And school based, they could have the same thing. They could absolutely be in the classroom base and in the home base because mm -hmm. they will have a much different format. They could be full time in the school base and also be home base. So if they do something like that, can they just take the, the screener or the formative assessments at one of the places? Or do they have to complete it like for the home-based program and for the, like can one student just take that one time? I would go back to okay, the great. screener, yes, absolutely. Same screener for all of But when it comes back to the formative assessments, I would look at like the instructional utility of the formative assessments. If you're doing the Pelly and the progress monitoring in that classroom base, that would guide your learning a lot different than the whole base. So You'll maybe have, formatively, they're going to have to take two different ones, and then that'll be in their IC, and it's how it's reported? You're going to report on the efficacy of them. You're not going to give us a specific formative assessment scores. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. I'm gonna be tired this one. That's all good. <laughs> I think I started that round of questioning just asking about, um, and and it popped in my head when we were talking about data, and I think Lori, you know, you said for the ease of, um, you know, sort of collecting that information, if if you had a student that was involved in multiple interventions. 
it might be hard for us to tease out which intervention, mm -hmm. like how would you tease out which intervention actually moved the dial for that particular kid if they were involved in multiple interventions or does that even matter? I don't know, but that jumped in my head. And then I, then I questioned whether or not they could even be eligible for more than one program. <laughs> it sounds like they can. We're going to have more questions great. than answers when we finish here. Aren't we? <laughs> I think the good thing, Jill, on that, that can only happen one time, right? Right. It can only With happen that four year, year old year, right? Because the other time they year. can't do the classroom. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely true. The form of assessment they're going to be different. But the question isn't going to be, how did they do it? What is the efficacy of and the intervention? So you will have different formative assessments in the jumpstart than what we will get from the home base. Mm -hmm. So you will have to report it to a point. I don't want it to be like 20 different reports on the formative assessments because of all these different programs and all these different grades. You'll have third grade or second grade huh? jumpstart, efficacy of formative, growth and then eligible not eligible that general that's that's probably making it way too simple <laughs> okay how can they be eligible okay i think we got that any other wow what's next what are we missing keep throwing them at us we're doing good <laughs> go ahead Debbie. hi i have a quick question just about the data tracking sorry to back up but I'm just thinking of year-to-year -year tracking. So say we have kids starting the four-year-old literacy intervention program, um, and then they move on with us, and they do maybe a jump start, I don't know, after kindergarten or something like that. Do we keep tracking their data until third grade? So we have this group of kids. Eventually, every year we'll have this group of kids that we need to look at their third grade scores to see if this early literacy intervention was successful, right? Because that's the whole yep. goal is that they be yep. proficient in third grade. So I just, I, it's, I don't it's going to be hard when we have multiple yeah. years of this to keep track of, you know, it's going to be almost, um, it's going to have to be somebody's job in the school to keep track of it all. So I want to rescue it even a little bit because what you will track longitudinally with that child is their eligibility in infinite campus. As you're reporting out the, oh, the okay. intervention, that will be at the end of every screening component. Um, now okay. we talked a little bit today about how do we follow kids long term? And we might right. have to use the logic of the surveys, like have they been enrolled or one, two, three years? That might be right. some where we're going to need your guys' feedback for those exact things. But in terms of that, we're going to be able to pull from infinite campus. Okay, they were eligible as a four-year-old, not as a kindergartner. Yes, as a first grader, not as a second grader, and be able to track them that way in terms of eligibility. Okay. I see. And then I get the whole, I get the conversation around the mast, but like in Helena, we use um, iReady and Acadians, which I know Acadians is approved and that's what we're going to use, but we have this year and it's second grade where we use I ready reading where they wouldn't necessarily be doing math yeah. right so we have like this pocket so we're just wondering can we use I ready or do we need to use Acadians with the kids who have been enrolled in either jumpstart I guess jumpstart at that point we could provide the opportunity to share that we have to report on the state proficiency assessment but I, I don't think it would be a bad thing to provide the opportunity if you wanted to share your district benchmarking to show the growth of those things. I don't, I think that's a little trickier as you're looking at your now six-year-olds when they're going to be 10. Right. And tracking on your part. Um, that's why mm -hmm. this definitely makes it a little bit easier. Let me, let me think about yeah. that. I'll that too on what you say. Okay. But straight from the middle, Just thinking, just thinking about the eligibility for those. Yeah second graders yeah. and I think I brought this up last time because it's still been something that we are thinking about so yeah. hey Marie you said when they screen and we determine they're eligible are we marking that in this year's infinite campus off of the April May June or do we mark it in next year's infinite camp infinite campus off or off of this year's April May and June so we just had that conversation. Kim, do you remember? 
I think it was going to be end of the year. And end of the year this year in IC to determine eligibility for next year. So what and if for they, next oh, school year? What if fall, but in the fall, um, those pieces. Go ahead, Lori. What's your next? Yeah. Time? So that makes the most sense to me. What the you fall. Say, Kimberly, but uh, oh. so like if if we screen the kids this year and you're going to at the end of the year you're going to mark them as hey they're going to be eligible next year they're not enrolled in the system if they're one of those four-year-olds. So they won't even be in infinite campus this year. So yes. it seems to work for everybody else. And if we were going to do a summer program, it's not eligible for them anyway. So that makes sense. But for the kids who screen eligible and aren't even enrolled yet, are we going to have two marking periods? One for the kids who could do summer school this year and one for the kids who weren't old enough but start in the fall? That's... That weird year too, right? With the whole July, which but that'll happen every time, Marie, wouldn't it? Yeah, because any any time a four year old comes, they're not already going to be enrolled yeah. in IC. Yeah, every year it's going to happen with the four year old. Yeah, so that'll have to probably be in that September components, and maybe the kindergarten. But I'll get clarity with our um AIM team, but it makes sense to me that. Kindergarten up, they are in infinite campus. They have their state ID. You can mark eligibility when they enroll in the fall for classroom base. You've already collected that they're eligible. You need to collect what this what the cutoff or the date was, which you'll have that on your forms and everything, like what the testing date was, eligible yes or no. Um, otherwise, you'd have to generate state IDs for all those little teeny boppers. Yeah, I just think it's going to be confusing to districts yeah. if we have to do it at different times. Yeah. That's what's confusing to me. I mean, I'm, I think it would be best if as soon as school opens, anyone who just participated in your summer or because the, the A and B's for that next year anyway, right? It's not for the Correct. previous year. So, hey, if they're participate, if they participate in your summer, they are participating in home or they are participating in early, mark them now. Yeah. Instead of marketing them the end of a previous year. Yeah, the jump starts the one that gets me with like having a calendar and marking it. We don't know, like, we don't know if we're going to require marking attendance, but also make it optional for you. Yeah, oh, I'm just thinking, though, the A and B, yeah. regardless of the July 1 discrepancy that we all disagree on, the A yeah. and B is clear. It's the next year. Yeah. Even yeah, if exactly. we were allowed to do it in June, the A and B is always the next year. So it seems yeah. like we should wait until the next year and mark participants one time. Yeah, because that's when it counts for makers. That's where it counts for, I, yeah, I I personally like having you do less to get the same information. Yeah. And but not mother time. Not. Yeah. Mother time says it's five minutes until five o'clock. Thanks, mother time. <laughs> I, don't well, I think I think oh. we can kind of wrap up. The other thing we had was just our mm -hmm. FAQ, just wanting to bring attention to that to make sure that you guys are continuously checking that for new information, new questions that are being answered um, and there. We have like one edit on there. Um, as that gets edited, we'll make, I think it's her, we'll, we'll share it out with you guys and it will be updated on the website too. We do get a lot of very individual type questions um, that we're taking in, whether it's about Exceptional circumstances. So, Lori, one thing I wanted to ask you, we only have a little bit of time. How are you taking on communicating with your community about the transition from exceptional circumstances to the early literacy targeted intervention? Um, we're not spending as much time on the transition. We're just explaining this is what's next year. Okay. And so we've done a lot of, um, you know, social media posts. We've done emails to every family in the community, we've um, talked to our um, Head Start, you know, our different agencies that we work with. We haven't focused on the transition. We've just focused on this is what we're offering next year. We haven't done the whole how it's different because really operationally for us, it's not that different. The difference is back end paperwork. It's yep. not front end services, right? Yep. I had one. Um, Jesse has her hand up too. Go ahead. Is it, I think it might still be up. Okay. Um, I was oh gosh, that. sorry. I can I can talk I about that really quick though, and I did have a question about this, and it's just yeah. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. So go ahead. in Helena, we've called our early entrance to kindergarten Kinder Sprouts, 
is that still an okay thing to call early literacy interventions for four-year-olds? I just feel like that's a mouthful and it might feel a little intense for parents. Um, yes. So we were wondering if we keep with the same program name and then we're just, we're just pushing it out as rather than the application, we need your child to be screened for this program. Um, because before we had an application with the exceptional circumstances on there. Um, yeah, so that's what we're doing. Yep. You can call whatever you want to call it. Um, the basis for it is just ensuring that the programming is geared for early literacy. Exactly. Yes. And our curriculum very much does that. So, I think it'll be it'll be good. Um, but yeah, I wanted to clarify that and make sure we aren't doing anything wrong. Thank you for that, Caitlin, on your catch on the FAQ. Yeah, well, so we're we're not like we haven't shared anything about the home based program with parents because it why? I mean, we don't even know what to share with them. Yeah. Right? And we haven't shared Jummer Jummer <laughs> Summer Jump Start. <laughs> Because we're only going to share it with families whose kids are eligible and we haven't screened yet. So yeah, the, right. mass, the mass advertising we have done is come get screened. If you're yeah. a three-year-old, four-year-old or coming into kindergarten, our traditional kindergarten roundup, our traditional child find, which this year also includes screening for early literacy. There That's the only difference we've done. We haven't done anything with Summer Jump Start or at home because we don't have the stuff to do that yet. Yep. Yep. And I, I reminded this individual, I was like, remember, your district sets the cutoff scores. So right. if you want to provide to as many as you currently are, they're in a small district, they only have 18 students, whatever that may be, as long as you're meeting all those pieces, you get to set those cutoff scores for who your district determines is potentially at risk of not make, making that trajectory. And Maria, I appreciate you saying that because we've had a couple of vendors saying OPI has told them otherwise. And I said, I'm sitting on calls with OPI. I'm sitting on the council. No one on either call has said vendors get to set cut scores. No one. Thank and you. So Thank you. I appreciate you reiterating that. Yeah. I think, and that's been very, very intentional. Like, right. If you want to let us know who those vendors are, we can make some phone calls. <laughs> what, what we have said is yes it's best practice to follow what the vendor says is a cut score they've done the research but you don't have to correct and that's what i said i said you know when i look at it from my point of view for educational best practices of course i'm going to consider what they recommend as the cut score yes and i'm going to mm -hmm. look at my population of students and determine does it fit if they tell me this cut, cut score is 50 and i say it's going to be anybody below the 98th percentile Y'all might want to question me, right? That seems a little silly. But if I say, no, it's going to be 55 instead of 50 based on what is yeah. our needs, we can do that. Yep. Yeah. Or you can qualify in multiple areas. Yep. Like, yep. Yeah. So good. That, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for saying that because that does answer a big question oh. that's coming from a vendor. Another question from a vendor was they were saying they would help schools screen kids out which ones are most needy i said you can't do that if they're no. eligible they get to attend you get to set the cut score but if they meet it once the cut score set it's like kindergarten they all get to come you can't say yeah. 40 kids met but we're only going to take the top 20. Uh -huh. yeah if you want to let me know okay. yeah we can we can talk offline Yes, but I mean, I clarified both those things. I said, you don't get to say a kid who's eligible doesn't get to participate because you don't have space. They also no. don't get to tell you who's eligible or not. You're using Correct. that. Tool. You're and using their how would How would they even know? Are you coming to look at my roster? You're not going to see who <laughs> I send to summer school or who I put in that early program, right? <laughs> I mean, that's so, very interesting. I'm glad I think that. clarifying that you can't cap it as well is really important from this collaborative, mm -hmm. right? That it's like kindergarten. If the kid qualifies, he's in. You can't say, oh, we're only going to take the top 20 neediest students, right? Yep. I know if 40 qualify, you're serving all 40. So that's where we give the guidance of that's where you're going to utilize and you, how you determine your cut scores. Right. Um, you, if you want to make, adjust that to be a lower percentile, things like that, but you can't cut. Right. You can, you can use your cut score, yep. but you but you can't just say you yep. met the cut score and now you can't come. Yeah, we did <laughs> better change your cut score. <laughs> yeah, we had someone say first come first serve do for class or days. I'm like, no, 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 no. that's not a good one. No, Caitlin, you can't do it up here. 
Okay. So um, our our school has a preschool already. We're planning to do um, the classroom based program. We uh, we have a couple of neighboring districts who do not have these programs. Um, if we I don't predict this is a situation that we'll get into, I think we'll welcome these students. But if we have students come from out of district and they test in and it pushes us over like that 10 or whatever, and we just can't feasibly financially make it work. Um, don't take how them. does that work? You don't have, just don't take them. have to take them. Okay. Yeah. The well, open well, enrollment, well. yeah. Open enrollment. It doesn't mean you have to take everybody. If you have, if you don't have, if you've hit your class limits, you just have to make sure it's in your strategic plan what your what your limits are. Mm -hmm. Thank you, K Caitlin. I also would say because you you know you might only have four kids, so you could take some, but leave at least one spot because you know kids are going to move in and be like, we have kids show up at the preschool in January. Mm -hmm. I remember yeah. going over there. I'm like, who are you? I knew. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, at this point, it would be a good problem to have, people, right? People, right? But Yep. I put in language straight from household 203 that says capacity, like limited building construct. Like there's a lot of reasons yep. where you can deny that out of district. Yep. And Caitlin, if you had room for five, but not 10, you can timestamp when they come in and take yep. the first five who are eligible and not take the other five. But if people come in January, we can't take them, right? Because you we have didn't room. Test you them could. in April, May, or June. No, it depends. Well, well it's like, if, yeah, true, if, Whitney. If, you can, take, you can take them, but you cannot collect right. A and B for them, right? Right. Yes. If you have a, a and B, but we would want to as like a very small right. district. We want to keep them in our preschool. Right. Get them in, the serve them for free. If keep them, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, hey, we're way over time, but it was such a good conversation. Right. The last time, I, the last thing I wanted to show was just this matrix. I think Katie gave us the idea at our last meeting. And so we went, Jackie and I went back to the table and kind of looked at developing something. So this is on our, um, on our website. And um, I think it just makes it really easy to show which student groups are eligible for which programs. So feel free to, to use that. Um, so our next meeting that we will have it will be april 10th at 3 30 um and we will see you guys then watch for emails we will try to update you guys with links and stuff ahead of time like when we update the faq we'll just send out an email to the collaborative saying hey look this is happening or Gary, i'll see what we need to do to send something outside of the compass just because we don't we do not want to be a barrier. It's hard. I, I mean, I told my staff this three times. I used to do a, do a Monday memo, and if my staff didn't read it and they asked me a question that was on it, I always said, go there. But we're trying to do that with the compass, but at the same time, a bit in your shoes where you have 5,000 things going on. The whole the intent of the compass was so you didn't get 90 emails from OPI. <laughs> yeah, the compass is just overwhelming. It's it a lot. Is. It's a lot. Yep. And I understand that needing that direct information. It is on the accreditation platform for when schools go to submit their their ISAP. So what um, is there? the link to the survey also. Oh. Just as an optional. They so Jill, they are if they are going into kindergarten. So if they are in classroom based as a four-year-old, but then leading up into kindergarten, they may be four, they may be five, they could even potentially be six. But that's the difference there, which we I've asked my team the same thing. And they're like, no, you're wrong. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> Does that help clarify that? It's weird. I know. I have to think of my own children and where they are in life to be able to justify, like, okay, they are now, but they aren't there. So, yeah. Oh, thank you all. I really, again, I really appreciate that you guys are jumping in and asking hard questions and we'll take it. We know, I, I know Lori's very aware of it and Trump and, but I hope you know that we really truly are, for, I, I'll try to take my camera off, but we truly are just trying to follow the intents of all of this, doing our very best work to serve you. We have an incredible team. I can't say more about these ladies and we really just want to make this successful for you and for kids because we are all teachers. We are all for kids and 
wanting these services there and we don't want to make any more barriers for you we that's part of why this collaborative is so important to us to hear your voice and to have that platform we do not want barriers um we have logistics that we have to work through and all those fun legal you have no idea how many times i've asked legal questions about this specific bill just making sure we're doing our best to interpret and get the information so thank you so much for being open and honest with us for sharing your perspective for sharing your confusion or the clarity pieces that are super clear. We really, we really do appreciate all of you. You're yeah. back. I we'll am. see you soon. Yeah. Thank Bye you everyone. All. Thank you for Thanks coming. Everybody. Thanks guys. It does, it's a quick turnaround and I think you guys are doing an awesome job. So <laughs> you got a lot of work on your you. hands. <laughs> By the way, we need Caitlin at some point, Marie. So I'm, I'm, she's on my list. <laughs> Sounds 